Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Um, and wherever you may be in the world, welcome. And uh, for everyone live, again, a welcome to you. Uh, it's uh, a blessing to be together again uh, on the Sabbath. And uh, for those who uh, are joining or just watching the video, uh, we welcome you to come join us. Uh, and if you want to come and join us live, uh, then uh, all you need to do is go to rivershabbat.com. And uh, just go to that home page, and if you scroll down, you're going to see Welcome to the River, and you hit that subscribe button. And when you do that, it'll ask for your first and last name and an email address, and that'll put you onto our weekly uh, community newsletter list, and that contains the link to the live gathering. And if you've never come and joined us live and meet others in the community, then uh, we encourage you to do so, and you're very welcome to do so. And uh, we would uh, look forward uh, to having you. All right. The Proverbs. The Proverbs. Who here appreciates the words contained in the book of Proverbs? Hands up. Hands up. There we go. Lots of hands. <laughs> I've got here to hear and do. Um, as we start this uh, journey looking at the Proverbs. Uh, and my disclaimer up front is, is that we are dealing with, you know, one of the greatest pieces of uh, literary writing in human history. And so whenever we look at this and what's been provided to us uh, in the Proverbs uh, and the wisdom that has been passed through uh, to the cultures and things like that, there's no way that we can do uh, justice, even in a series like this. So we're we're going to go through and we're going to look at things and uh, try and extract from this um, uh, not only you know this uh, this uh, knowledge, but um, to gain an understanding uh, from that knowledge that hopefully can translate into wisdom uh, into our lives in various aspects. Um, so when uh, so we're going to take a journey in this um, because there are many things uh, that. Uh, are there to bless us and uh, reproof us, correct us, confront us uh, as we look at this incredible uh, ancient writings and wisdom that were given to us uh, for this test in the time domain. I've got here a quote uh, from William Hazlitt, and um, he was an English SS uh, uh, a drama, literary critic, painter, social commentator, and philosopher. Um, uh, I don't know too much about uh, this man's life and testimony, but I do know that this quote from him uh, is hits the mark. He says here, the seat of knowledge is in the head of wisdom in the heart. And so... This statement, this this uh, understanding that he has is he's clearly making the distinction that we can gain knowledge. But there's a process that we go through to understanding what it is that we have learned. And that ultimately can translate uh, into wisdom uh, if things get on our heart. Um, our world has plenty of knowledge. And as it's playing with, you know, AI and our digital gadgets and computers and, you know, the smartphones and the internet and all these sorts of things, we've got all this knowledge at our disposal. But do we have understanding? And does that understanding actually translate to wisdom? Because wisdom will ultimately be how we handle the knowledge we have. Knowledge in and of itself is not the goal. It is a part of the process we want to seek and understand, particularly his knowledge. But we need that to get to understanding that it may become wisdom. And I think this is what William here is, is actually able to identify. Uh, what he was able to do was to look at this and go, yeah, knowledge is one thing, but the ability to apply it in our lives is quite another. And if that doesn't get on the heart, we're going to be in trouble. And 
And in fact, um, knowledge without understanding that eventually translates to wisdom is actually dangerous. And uh, one of the alarming things we're seeing is this whole AI starting to come forth and we are going to be uh, ensnared in a world of where knowledge is easily uh, available to us and what we're all living at the end of the age. Um, but the ability to handle any of this and to understand it and it's, uh, you know, our responsibility, our accountability and consequence in it uh, is greatly compromised. And so what we are seeing is something that is fueling us unto our folly, our destruction. I actually think that the Proverbs uh, help us at this time uh, more than any other, that we should be taking these words now and applying them as we uh, uh, sort of plunge into this uh, crazy world that we're in as we come to the end of the age. These words are going uh, to um, preserve us, protect us, to guide us, to help us. This ancient wisdom that has been given to us uh, ultimately uh, from the Creator are things for us to really visit at this time. And so this is why we're going to go on this journey in the book of Proverbs. Probably the venture into AI has spurned me or uh, the Father's put on my heart to actually, uh, for us to revisit this at this time as a community. I know for myself uh, to actually do it because um, these words uh, sincerely will not only nourish us, um, but they will protect us if we understand uh, what we have here. Okay. Um, to hear and do. So... Again, we're going to, I just want to touch on Endeavorim here in Deuteronomy 6, starting in verse 1 and 2, the Shema. Now, this commandment, the statutes and the rules that Yah, your Elohim, commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it. So Moshe was entrusted with the foundation and the writings of our faith, which we call the Torah, and for us to look at these things. And in Endeavorim, the last book of the Torah, it says that you may fear uh, or revere your Elohim, you and your son and your son's sons, so that this may be something that is passed down, that is understood, and that is valued and treasured for this, uh, for this test. By keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I've commanded you all the days of your life, that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as Yah, the Elohim of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, your Elohim, Yah is one. You shall love your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. I'm going to suggest to you that if we don't get knowledge into understanding and understanding into wisdom, what you're reading here in Devarim and Deuteronomy 4, 6 cannot be done. This isn't about reciting a liturgical portion of the Torah. That's not why this has been given. He means it. And then we don't read on, post this. And uh, when you read further on in this great book of Deuteronomy, you will see where the blessings and the curses are. There's something interesting here, and I want you to mark this. They will have dread. I want you to just park in your minds the word dread. In Deuteronomy 11, 25, 28, uh, I'll pull out just a portion here where it's saying, no one shall be able to stand against you. So if we get this and to understand this, no one is going to be able to stand against you. Yah, your Elohim, will lay the fear of you, the dread of you on all the land, that you shall tread what you are walking, where you are, where we have been scattered even. This applies to us today and has for the whole time to me, wherever we go, as he has promised you, see, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey 
the commandments of Yah, your Elohim, which I command you today, and the curse if you do not obey the commandments of Yah, your Elohim. But turn aside from the way. When Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When you turn away, literally, you're going to turn away from Messiah. You're going to turn away from what this is all actually about. And indeed, sadly, there are folly and where people have done this in ministries that teach not what they ought not to. In 2 Peter chapter 2, there is a very stern warning as to the result of those who would go down this path, these false teachers, these false things, and even denying the blood that bought them. And the warnings on this are very serious. And in fact, if you understand what this is being compared to in 2 Peter, the whole book of Jude talks about this. He compares to those fallen angels that were put into Tartarus because they would go and choose their own path and not the path of their creator. And as a result of that, they're going to face the great white throne judgment. And those people and those ministries that would go as far as denying the blood of Messiah and that would bring in damnable heresies, which is being mourned by Peter, they will not be a part of the event of Yom Teruah. They will not be raised from Sheol. They will be raised to the great white throne judgment. It is very serious, these warnings. And yet we're seeing it just like it was prophesied in the word. People silly enough to actually deny the blood that bought them. And yet we're seeing it. But look at this as to why they do it. But they turn aside from the way that I'm commanding you today to go after other gods. Another gospel, another Elohim, another Messiah that you have not known. This and what many people miss when they don't read on in this incredible book and in this Devarim, in this chapter 6, and reading on and going into chapter 11 and reading and understanding the blessings of the curse, they are directly attached and linked to spiritual adultery. You will choose these false teachings this other Elohim, denying Messiah, throwing away the foundation of our faith, not staying on the way. Indeed, the consequences and the warning of this, and from the early Kahal, captured in the Brit Hadashah in our New Testament, are very, very serious indeed, and they indeed link right back to the Torah. The early church or the early Kahal almost 2,000 years ago stood on the principles of the foundation of their faith and they knew how to apply it. And now we live in this world being fueled by all manner of weirdness. People being turned to myths, heresies, doctrines of demons, all in the name of God. How do I hear and do? How do we hear and do? It's a big question. Has very serious implications, blessings and curses that are attached to it that will go right through to the end of this age. Are we really asking ourselves this? Do we hear? Do we understand? Does this translate to our witness? Do we care? Because if we don't care, we won't do. I suggest to you that in the book of Proverbs, this is one of the best ways to help us to hear and do is the incredible wisdom that is contained in what we call the Old Testament, which unfortunately many have thrown away. Proverbs of Solomon this is often contained in, in Jewish speak in the third division of the Ketavim, the Hebrew. It's divided into four sections. And this is a part of all these great collection of books, the Psalms, the Proverbs, um, Book of Job, 
Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, uh, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, and the prophets, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Second Chronicles. These are all a part of containing great wisdoms, warnings, understanding, application. The Proverbs help us to hear and do. And as we look and go through the Proverbs, know that they are absolutely attached to the foundation of our faith. One of the most important literary writings and one of the most important components that I know of in all of what we call the Old Testament or the Tanakh. This is where we get into the application, the confronting, the understanding of what it is that we're being called to as a part of our faith and indeed what our Elohim has done and to help us as we traverse the waters of this time domain. The definition of proverb in the English, a short saying in frequent and widespread use that expresses a basic truth, wisdom, or practical pre, uh, a precept, often repeated, grocrioli, expressing a well-known truth, common fact, experience, observation, even a popular saying, briefly and forcibly expresses some practical precept, adage, metaphor, sometimes in the form of a rhyme, reproach, even a subject of scorn and derision. So this is our English sort of proverb, you know, when we look at this. And there's many types of proverbs from ancient cultures and ancient wisdom from the ancient world. However, the definition being used in the Hebrew slightly brings about, I believe, a deeper meaning. And it, and it reflects in why we see it in the pattern of Messiah himself, the mashal, the definition here. So this is the Hebrew word being used for proverb, mashal. What's interesting about this is it relates to a parable, saying, byword, similitude, poem, ethical wisdom, maxims, even the understanding to rule. I'm also going to point out here to have dominion. This is interesting. So I want to just reflect on here what's in the Hebrew, parables, dominion. You mean this could actually link to ruling and reigning? And is this why maybe perhaps it's come out through some of the kings? Why it was entrusted to these certain family lineages and whatnot? Because they understood the direct understanding of this wisdom to understand and to take these properties seriously relate to rule. Now, if we know what's coming in the final age, this is very interesting because this could be one of the most important books in relationship to the bride of Messiah and how this is going to be applied. We want these Proverbs to go from knowledge to understanding to our heart because I don't think we're going to have printed press in the final age. And so where is this dominion, this reign, going to come from? To be able to exercise it, to bring about right ruling. The word dominion there, to control, sovereignty. Territory, sphere, influence, realm, self-governing of a nation. Well, what if it was the nation of the house of Israel and Messiah ruling and reigning over the earth in this final age? Would these words mean something to us? The book of Arburbs. So these, you know, an author in scholarship and whatnot, it remains a debate amongst scholars regarding exactly precise dates and certain components of its authorship. For the sake of going through this series, generally chapters 1 to 24 directly attributed are generally understood to be at the hand of Solomon himself, um, or at least gathered or overseen by him. Chapters 25 to 29, the writings are uh, attributed to the sons of Hezekiah. So, you know, again, a kingly understanding and lineage. So this is being brought forth in these ways. And then the final chapters uh, of 3031 being a tribute to uh, Ariel and uh, uh, Lemuel. So we've got these writings and they're coming through and it's coming through from dominion, but also through parable understanding. And so this is going to link into something that was patterned by Messiah. These wisdom writings providing the saints and instructions that have endured thousands of years. The ancient writings out of Egypt and Mesopotamia regions also reveal some of the common ground amongst these ancient cultures. So the ruling and dominions of other cultures have also retained and understood the wisdom of the creator. Even if they'd gotten off path, it's amazing how some of that wisdom is also captured in the other Proverbs from the other cultures. 
cultures. Proverbs is a collection of collections, a saying of sayings relating to the pattern of sayings and understanding for life. Sayings of both wisdom and folly for us to understand. This book of biblical wisdom, it raises the questions of values, moral behavior, the actual meaning of life, and right ruling. Elohim's wisdom is praised for the creation, bringing order out of the chaos. Whatever has happened, whatever went on as to why this time domain, this test has been presented and set up by Elohim, he has done it for good reason. It might be temporary. It may be Havel, but it is not without purpose and without meaning. The order of creation and seeking this wisdom being one of the goals of the time domain test. Approximately half of the book is made up of the sayings and half instructions. Often written from the perspective, and again, if it's coming from a dominion perspective, think kingship, it is written from the perspective of the teacher or king or parent being addressed as if we are the student and the child. And if any of you have gone through or you're reading the Proverbs, you will feel like a student or a child. And so we're supposed to. It's actually giving us these teachings, instructions as wisdom and sayings uh, for to help us bring knowledge into the understanding perspective. The Proverbs raises the questions of values, moral behavior, meaning of human life, uh, and righteous conduct. So this wisdom anthology, the definition of anthology, a collection of literary pieces, such as poems, short stories, plays, various items, ingredients so that come into all of this, especially uh, composing, and it's got here, of diverse literary works, assortment, catalog, even of complaints, comments, or ideas. Generally accepted that the Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, as we see uh, in our uh, modern day biblical format, uh, in the Tanakh is broken into six sections. And this first section is one to nine. Um, it comprises initially of an invitation to when we're in the youth, the course of learning, understanding the discipline and instructions. The second section being around um, is sort of the um, uh, made up of this short moral discourses, various subjects and saying. And this is one of the big reasons why many of the scholars believe it was included uh, as a part of the canon of the Tanakh. The third section of the declaration, to incline our ear, to listen and hear the words of the wise. This has not come at our hand, my hand, your hand, anybody's hands that we know. This is the collection of the dominion of kingship lineage given to us to help us now at this time. And I'll tell you, as we come to the end of the age, and with the amount of knowledge that's being thrown out there, discernment is going to become a huge, huge portion of us staying on the path right now. And so what this is going to give us essentially in this anthology is discernment. The fourth section of this, we've got this thing from the sons of Hezekiah, King Hezekiah. In the fifth section, and then the final section, the words of Agur and Lemuel. This book will finish with stating to us, and when we look at certain things here, that he is Elohim. He is the divine creator, the divine power. And, there, and our place is to overcome from our human ignorance. And it will finish with the great description of the ideal Israelite woman or Hebrew woman, the Proverbs 31 woman. How many Proverbs 31 women do we have here on the screen today? <laughs> how, how many deluded women do we have here? <laughs> Indeed, this book, and the reason why I labor that a little bit is it's going to expose us. It's going to expose all of us, not just the women. But the women has a, the the reason why a woman is used is I believe this is very much again pointing to the final age, because whether you know it, like it, or understand it, we are considered the woman in this great picture. All of us. 
And so this is interesting why it finishes with this description. Is this just about you guys get to use this to, you know, remind your wives of what they're not? Is that what, how we're supposed to use the Proverbs? Or was it supposed to actually give us knowledge, understanding that would equate to wisdom? And is that wisdom far beyond being able to take scripture and criticize the shortcomings of our human experience? I'd suggest to you that it's much greater. There's something greater going on here. And it links into these parables and this dominion. Those of you who know me in the teachings and whatnot, and I couldn't stay away from not raising this. Um, it is my uh, one of my most favorite uh, scriptures, and then I'll often uh, refer to this. It is the glory of Elohim to conceal things. It's to his glory. Is he going to conceal things? You better believe it. He is asking us to find things, to seek it out, to ask, to find the pearls of great price, to do these things. But as the glory of kings is to search things out. And this is coming through the sons of Hezekiah. They are seeing examples. They're seeing understandings. You know, the, the, the penship of Solomon. We've got these things where they know that something's being entrusted to those who will have dominion. So those who will have dominion seem to be bestowed with something. That which is entrusted to rule and reign over others are going to be bestowed with something that Elohim conceals. As the heavens for the height and the earth for their depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. Wow. The heart of that, which is going to seek these things out in itself will in the end become unsearchable. It will become so vast with its understanding. The glory, the word there used, the kavod in the Hebrew, splendor, honor, riches, weightier matter, glory, reputation, and reverence. But it is the glory or the of kings to search it out. Isn't this interesting how there's an achad understanding with what this revealing or this presence or this glory comes forth with this process? However, take away the dross from the silver and the smith has material for a vessel. He is going to have to purge us from the impurities of our lives. And the direct relation as we'd sit into here and to do the direct relationship to blessing and curses is directly related to spiritual adultery. What is in the house? What's in our faith? What dross is there? Are we a vessel that the potter has to smash? Take away the wicked from the presence of the king and his throne will be established in righteousness. I believe that statement you are seeing here in this great proverb is directly relating to the ruling and the reigning of Messiah and his bride in the final age. That which will be sitting with him on the throne and will be establishing righteousness upon the earth will no longer be considered wicked. The order of matters in chapter one and two, and I've got here kingdom reign, discipleship, wicked conspiracy, not listening, reproof, and the covenant. These are just some things we're just going to touch on uh, that we're going to pull out of chapters in one and two. Again, this whole matter of getting this, you know, uh, um, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom is all going to link into responsibility, accountability, and consequence. Wisdom understands consequences. Does everybody know how much wisdom seems to be lacking out there in the ruling and reigning of the world today? <laughs> and, and, and do these so-called rulers in, uh, on the world, this unrighteous ruling that we're seeing going on, do they really understand consequence anymore? What you are seeing play out is literally these things. So again, 
just think of, you know, and we've gone through this before, just think while we go through the Proverbs, responsibility, accountability, and consequence, and attached to it, knowledge, responsibility, and awareness, understanding then brings in accountability and consequence will then be brought with wisdom and the understanding of it. Consequence is not a bad thing. Consequence just is the absolute application of the forerunners. So who's got their Bibles? Has everybody got their Bibles? Okay. Let us read chapters one and two together today. And we can start this, uh, we can start this incredible journey. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the sovereign of Israel. For knowing wisdom and discipline, for understanding the words of understanding, for receiving discipline of wisdom, the consequence of wisdom, righteous right ruling and straightness, for giving insight to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. The wise one hears and increases learning. And the understanding, one gets wise counsel. For understanding a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles, their parables. The fear of Elohim is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and discipline. Fools despise Wisdom and discipleship. I don't listen to any man. Anybody ever heard that before? I don't want, I don't do this. I don't do that. There's no way I'm subjecting myself to discipleship. Yet you're in a faith based and built upon it. A Messiah that modeled it, demonstrated it, and gave it to you. Oh, no, I don't need discipleship in my life. Everything we have in the Creator is built on discipleship. Do parents disciple their children in the workplace? Are you discipled by a boss? You, why is it that we've gotten to such a place where we don't actually understand that our whole faith is built on a pattern of discipleship? And Yeshua came back to give us this, to model it and say, this is how it shall look. And do you know what I see missing in the majority of the body? Discipleship. It's no wonder we're lacking wisdom. We've all become islands unto ourselves, thinking we know better. We do not, but we're deluded enough to think we do. My son, heed the discipline of your father and do not forsake the Torah of your mother, for they are a fair wreath on your head and chains about your neck. Do you know that this is absolute bridal language? The bride being adorned by the husband. Why is such bridal language being used here at the beginning of this incredible book? My son, if sinners entice you, do not give in. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol and entirely like those going down to the pit. Let us find all the precious good. Let us fill our houses with spoil. Let's let greed take hold. Cast in your lot among us. Let us all have one purse. Let us all have a global government. Let us all have a global economic system. Let us, this is all going to finish in this place by the adversary. As the wicked rule, they will bring it to this place. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. For their feet run to evil, and they hurry to shed blood. For in vain the net is spread, and in the sight of any that possesses a wing. But they lie in wait. For their own blood. <laughs> they'll turn on you. They'll turn on each other. Wickedness. 
They ambush their own lives. And in the process, they are hijacking themselves from the very meaning of the time domain itself. Such are the ways of everyone greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owners. Wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the broad places. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out. At the opening of the gates in the city, she speaks her words. How long, you simple ones, would you love simplicity? And shall scoffers delight in their scoffing? And fools hate knowledge. This picture of wisdom, indeed the Ruach itself. How precious she is, and she's crying out. But the fools and the scoffers delight in their scoffing. And they hate the intimate knowledge. They turn at my reproof. See, I pour out my spirit on you. I make my words known to you. Because I called you and you refused. I stretched out my hand. No one inclined. And you spurned all my counsel. And would not yield to my reproof. Let me also laugh at your calamity. Mock. When your dread comes. Remember the word dread. If we're in him, apparently they're going to be those that dread the reality that we walk in righteousness. The other result is that dread will come to us in this time domain due to our folly. Our ability to not be reproofed, corrected, to walk in discipline, discipleship. When your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, let them then call on me, but I will not answer. They have refused the way. And now they cry out. Let them seek me, but not find me, because they hated knowledge. His knowledge, his intimate knowledge, they hated it and did not choose the reverence or the fear of Elohim. They did not accept my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore, let them eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own counsels. For turning away of the simple kills them, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But whoever listens to me dwells safely and is at ease. Look at this. From the dread of evil. In this incredible opening set of verses in what we call chapter one. There's either you're going to dread because of the paths you've chosen and you're going to be in dread as a result, or you're going to choose the paths of life and you will become the dread. Just hold on to that thought. My son, if you accept my words and treasure up my commands with you, if you accept my words and treasure up my commands with you so that you make your ear attend to wisdom, the outcome of this is going to be wisdom, knowledge, understanding, wisdom. Incline your heart to understanding. For if you cry for discernment, lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her hidden treasures, then you would understand the fear of Elohim and find the knowledge of Elohim. For Elohim gives wisdom and out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. The application of that knowledge and understanding is wisdom. And he treasures up the stability for the straight, a shield to those walking blamelessly, to watch over the path of right ruling, dominion, and the way of his loving committed ones he guards, just like a bridegroom, just like a husband, he will guard those who do this. This is what a husband does. He guards his bride. He protects her. 
He puts a protective hedge around her, protective sukh. The way of his loving committed ones, he guards. Then you would understand righteousness and right ruling and straightness, every good path. Is he going to allow us to take our path? Yes. And if we walk in wisdom, will we allow him to stand in that path if we shouldn't walk it? Yes. But we will be responsible for our sovereign choices. For wisdom would enter into your heart. Whoa. Wisdom will enter into your heart. Man, the heart's got an important part in all of this. The essence of our nefesh. And knowledge be pleasant to your being. Discretion would guard you. Understanding would watch over you to deliver you from the evil way, the evil path, the wicked path. From man who speaks perversities, those who leave the paths of straightness, to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil, actually rejoice to do evil. They delight in the perversities of evil whose paths are crooked and they are perverted in their ways. To deliver you from the strange woman. Ooh, there's two women in this incredible thing we call the Bible. In this incredible set of writings and this word of Elohim and the testament of those who followed him. There's a warning of something. It's another woman. This incredible story of two women, a bride and a whore. Think about to hear and do. The warning was against spiritual adultery. To deliver you from the strange woman, from the foreigner who flatters with her words, who forsakes the companion of her youth. And has forgotten. Look at this. The covenant of her Elohim. She's broken the ketubah. She's spiritually adulterating. For her house has sunk down to death. And her past to dead. Think Sheol. Think what we have to be raised from on Yom Teruah and the great fulfillment of the fall appointed times. It's Sheol. None going into her does return, nor do they reach the pass of life. So walk in the way of goodness and guard the pass of righteousness for the straight shall dwell in the earth and the perfect be left in it. But the wrong shall be cut off from the earth and the treacherous ones plucked out of it. The reference scripture I'll give there, and I believe the great apostle Peter in Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, stands in the place of prophet. Read the chapter. It is a warning to those who would embrace spiritual adultery. And that warning is they're not going to be raised as a part of this event. And the biggest thing he attaches to that is that they're denying the blood of Messiah. Many of you have heard me say parables, the pattern of Messiah. This is what we see when he walked the earth and he literally is giving us a demonstration. I believe this living book of Proverbs he used parables all the time as a part of the pattern that he gave as a part of modeling discipleship. And in discipleship, he used parables, questions, often rhetorical, and repetition, all for the purpose of developing critical thought as a part of discipleship. Parables, questions, repetition. And I promise you, if you start to walk in discipleship with others, you will eventually find yourself giving parables. Think of it like this. Riddle me this. 
you will have questions, both rhetorical and legitimate, and you will go over and over again what you think you already know. Because you don't know. Has anybody ever read a part of, portion of the Bible that you've read maybe a thousand times and ever wondered if you'd ever read it before? <laughs> That's the living word. Why the parables? Yeshua captured here in Matthew 13, and uh, we'll start at 10, 10, 12. Then the disciples came to him and said, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered to them, this is really interesting. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Oh, this unsearchable thing, this thing that is going to require dominion. You will understand from the parables. Why? I'm going to suggest this links right back to the, to the Shema, to being able to hear and do. But to them, it has not been given. To those who cannot hear, it's not been given. They cannot perceive this. For the one who has more will be given. Uh, more will be given. And he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. It is it important that we actually take knowledge that it may, we may find understanding that it may translate to wisdom. Can we actually understand the parables unless that has occurred? By the way, the context of this was often referring to the most knowledgeable biblical people far more knowledgeable than any of us concerning matters of the Torah and the prophets, the Sanhedrin. But they couldn't hear. Therefore, they would not do. And their paths became crooked. Messiah stood against this. It's interesting where he goes with this, and he's going to relate to the great prophet Isaiah and his vision concerning the, the seraphim and uh, his great vision of Messiah. And this is where he touches his lips with the coal. But this is where our master goes. He says, this is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. I'm going to suggest to you this might be directly even protecting them at both the great, uh, at both the Bema seat of the judgment seat of Messiah and the great white throne. Is it interesting that he may be speaking to us in such a way that our accountability too much is given, much is required? The more that we gain knowledge of him, the true knowledge of him, the more that that brings about understanding, the more that that brings into wisdom, the more accountable we become. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. It says you will indeed hear but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. Interesting. Just hold those two. Understand and perceive in the English is what we're seeing there. For the people's hearts grow dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and with their eyes they are closed, lest should they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart. Ooh, here comes the heart again. understanding something's going to play out where does true wisdom play out does it play out in the brain in your knowledge or will true wisdom play out in the heart and turn and i would heal them the definition of perceive here being used in the hebrew out of isaiah is to discern they will be able to discern the being, to understand, consider, to know, observe, mark, give heed, to distinguish, insight, intelligence, discreet, to be able to teach, to show oneself discerning, attentive, consider, diligently, instruct, think right ruling, prudent in regard. The definition of understand being used here in the Hebrew, the yada in Hebrew, to know, Learn to know, perceive, discern. 
So you mean this is all going to require discernment of everything around us? Well, I'll tell you what, in this modern age, with all the knowledge that's available to us, does anybody think discernment might be something that we need at this time? Or is your knowledge or so-called knowledge going to save you? We need to perceive and to understand. Look at this, to distinguish, to know by experience, to be able to live out, to recognize, admit, acknowledge, confess, to be acquainted with, skillful in, to be wise, revealed, to make oneself known. That's interesting. So the understanding of Messiah is going to start to make himself known to us, cause us to know. And here's the interesting thing. For us to be known to him. Think of those words the Messiah says at the judgment seat. I do not know you. Master, master, didn't we, didn't we? I do not know you. Do you mean this whole process that we're going through? Do you mean the Proverbs can help us to understand to the point of it turning into wisdom. And that wisdom ultimately is a revealing of him to us and us to him. And then he relates it directly to his coming as a part of the great fulfillment of the spring appointed times. They're about to be fulfilled literally on earth this great plan of redemption, all captured in Leviticus, the instructions to honor the appointed times. The first of those appointed times in the spring, Moedim, are going to be fulfilled. They're about to be. This we says to them, but blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. They understand the parables. They can discern this. He's literally saying, blessed are your eyes, for they see. Who do they see? The actual giver. He's relating to the vision that Isaiah had in Messiah. Blessed are their eyes. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it. And to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Do you know the antecedent of this statement is the vision of Isaiah? And if you know what you're reading in the Hebrew scriptures, you'll know who and what he was actually seeing. And then he directly confirms it. Make no mistake about it. They wished to actually see what you're seeing in front of you. They longed for it. They understood it. They knew the wisdom. They knew what this really was all about. And there was a whole Sanhedrin that was about to reject the Messiah. Not only did they not long to, they couldn't even recognize. Much the same way today, many cannot recognize what they're reading in Isaiah. From the opposite end, they don't even know what they're reading in Isaiah. They don't know that that's Messiah, that they're actually reading about. They think they're looking at, you know, I don't know, whatever their concoction is of their Godhead, and they think that they can conceive Father God. None of us have the capacity to understand Elohim. But we actually have become ignorant and arrogant enough to think that we can. We will see him the way he chooses us to see him. We will understand him the way he chooses us to understand him. And if you want to hold on to your mystery Babylon, you will not perceive ultimately. Will there be right ruling? Will there actually be right ruling? Many of us are experiencing the dread of not having right ruling on earth. We're living this now and it's playing out all over the world. It will come to an end. Look at this in Isaiah 2, 2, 4. Isaiah, this great prophet Isaiah. Oh boy, did he have insight. Did he have wisdom? Did he know? He heard and he saw. He knew. It says, it shall come to pass in the latter days. These last 
2,000 years that we've been since Messiah. The mountain of the house of Yah shall be established. It will be established. The mountain, the house of Yah shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up to the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. Everybody understands that's not been fulfilled yet, right? <laughs> Isaiah knew. And many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Yah, to the house of Elohim of Yahab, and that he may teach us his ways and that he may walk, that we may walk in his paths. Is that happening right now? Oh, indeed, we have a final age to come, and there's a big reason for it. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, the Torah, and the word of Yah from Jerusalem. It's going to come out. Right ruling is going to come. And so the only question is, is understanding how Elohim is going to achieve that. And if we know what the word is saying, he's going to achieve this through Yeshua Messiah, and a reigning and ruling dominion, a governance that will sit with him. And Revelation 19.15 puts it like this, from the mouth comes a sharp sword to which strikes down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. The rabdos in the Greek, in the Hebrew, the equivalent of the Shavat, assured a ruling staff is going to, he will tread the wine press of the fury of the wrath of Elohim. The Almighty. There's something assured that is coming to rule. The Lion of the tribe of Yehuda, Messiah. Can true understanding, I want you to think about this question, can true understanding be gained without knowledge and discipleship? If we're just to take the pattern of Messiah, if we're to understand the knowledge and the instruction of righteousness given to us in Torah and of the prophets and the great ancient writings of the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the book of Job, these accounts that we see, can true understanding of all of this be gained if we don't have that knowledge and if we don't have the way to work through the dross to be prepped as a vessel for service? How important is discipleship? In Psalms 2, 8, 10, it says this, Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage. What? The nations are going to be your heritage? If you actually go down this, are you mean there's going to be dominion attached? Something's going to be selected? Look at this. And the ends of the earth, your possession. We know in scripture that all things were given to Messiah, all authority is put under him all that should be striking to whatever your, your understanding of his divinity may be to understand those words all and then we see this in the psalms the ends of the earth your possession you shall break them with a rod of iron hmm and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Do you know if a pot had the, too many impurities and whatnot, what did the potter do with that? Smash. Just like the dross. It's all about vessels. That's it. We're going to get crushed. Do you know that many of us, through the crushings of our lives, through the pressing, the, uh, a, a great oil can come from this process. Many of you have been gone through smashings, crushings. Do you know that when you're with a brother or sister that's in a crushing in their life, this could be one of the greatest people to walk with that you could have in all your fellowship. When there's a crushing in a discipleship environment and you get around that person in their crushing and you share in their crushing, you also share in their oil. Because I'll tell you, when you're in a place of crushing, do you tend to hear better or worse? <laughs> I know for me in the crushings of my life and what I've been through in the breaking of my vessel is when my ears started to hear. Wow. 
There's a process attached to this. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise and be warned, O rulers of the earth. Look at this first address to O kings. Dominion, those who have dominion. Be wise. You need the wisdom. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Boy, is there a people right now all over this planet that need to hear this. Look at this in Luke 640. Also told them a parable. So this is the blind man, okay? And this is going to be related to judging and causing division with others. And, you know, this is the log and the speck in context of what's going on here. But he says, he told them the parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? So literally, can someone who has not taken knowledge to understanding and now is applying his wisdom, can that person lead someone else who has not started the process? How about someone who only has knowledge and has no way to apply it? A disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Think of what he's modeling in this discipleship. When you are fully trained, and he's saying this to his disciples, you will become like me. But when a disciple, when a person, the student, the child, the, um, the worker, the whatever it is, the servant, whenever they think that they know better, are they above the one who is teaching them? Their ears are going to close. Hebrews 12, 11, it's like this. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. <laughs> yeah. Anybody here like correction and reproof? I don't. But I do know this. In order to receive it in a healthy and balanced way, we want to be in an environment where we've learned to trust others, don't we? You see, if you can trust your parents or you can trust your brothers or your sisters, if there's reproof and correction needed, you know that they love you and you've walked with them enough to know that you can learn to trust them. You don't just trust glibly. You don't just hand your trust over to anyone. Walk with others that you may learn this. Trust is not earned. It is learned. And when it is learned, there'll come those times of discipline in our lives, this reproof, this correction that we may gain wise counsel. And if we do, if we can go through the breaking of our vessels, with the removing of the dross from our lives, if we can do this, a peaceful fruit of righteousness, a shalom fruit of righteousness is going to come to those who are trained by this process. It'll actually bring shalom into our lives. It is a wonderful thing to get counsel, even if it's in the form of correction and reproof. <laughs> which sometimes is necessary, but even to get it in that place, it, is a, it brings shalom when we receive this counsel because it brings forth the blessing talked about in Devarim in our lives. What does it mean to be at ease from the dread of evil? Remember I told you, think of this dread. We either become the dread or we experience dread. Which one do you want to be on? Do you want to be full of dread from your circumstances? Or do you want to be the one that others will dread? Because dread's going to happen, apparently, in this time domain. Just going to read to you quickly from the great prophet Isaiah again. 11.13, he says, For Yah spoke thus to me with his strong hand upon me and warned me not to walk in the way of, the, of this people, saying... Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Elohim host, him you shall honor as holy or set apart. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Isn't this interesting? You mean if Elohim... And the reality of our existence, our faith, our being able to be broken, to be shaped, and to be this, he will become. Not this world and full of conspiracies. You know that there's ministries being built right now on feeding people nothing but conspiracies. 
whether they have a little bit of truth in them or not, no one seems to care anymore. It's all really interesting. And we can, you know, uh, hypothesize all sorts of things that the Wiley adversary is getting up to. But the word conspira conspiracy there, the, ca the Kassar, alliance to bind, to bind together, to league together, to conspire, to do this in a vigorous way. So they're coming across there, and this in the context here was the Assyrian invasion, the king of Assyria, that there was something coming upon them in this Assyrian invasion. And Elohim's reminding them at this point, I think it's a good reminder for us all now, who, who, Elohim's who we should dread, not all the possibilities of the things that are conspiring against us. I've got here unmasking the beast system. You know, there are things going on on the earth now at such a scale at such a level, and it's all starting to be unmasked and exposed. And do you know many people in the body are experiencing dread as a result? And yet that's interesting because if we had the shalom that we were supposed to have, we wouldn't be dreading this and what's in front of you in the screen, this unrighteous ruling that's going on across the earth. We would actually fear Elohim. We would have the reverence of Elohim. Do you know that Messiah says to pray for your enemy? Matthew 5.44. The context here are those who are not necessarily your brethren. Who here has prayed lately for your president, your prime minister? Who here has prayed for Klaus Schwab's lately? That they may see the light of truth. <laughs> I don't see a lot of hands. <laughs> By the way, I'm guilty as charged. I really struggle sometimes. I almost start mumbling. <laughs> <laughs> so I will with them. I mean, that, that'll count. <laughs> I've prayed for my enemies. Good check. Check. Do you know we're so busy being consumed by all of the dread that possibly is coming from this that we're forgetting the very instructions of Messiah? No, 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 no. Pray for those ones. Are we really a community that does that? I think maybe if we're honest, we might all need to get better at this because this unrighteous ruling that's going on on the earth right now is going to come to an end. It is. It's going to come to an end. And it's going to come to the end, apparently, according to the prophet Isaiah, um, like they were facing with uh, the Assyrian invasion at the time, like we're facing now with this beast system here coming in at the end of the age. Don't fear whatever you think they're up to or may be up to or might be up to or whatever is going on in the end. In the end, make sure that this translates to you walking with a reverence to me that you may have wisdom and discernment. What if the real enemy is in the house? What if it's actually in the house? What if really what we're to deal with here is exactly what the Proverbs said, and there's some woman, some strange woman that we're to be weary of? What if it exists in the faith? What if this actually exists in the faith? And what if this was the thing? Is the World Economic Forum or the United Nations or World Health Organization or Council on Foreign Relations or whatever else, are those the ones stealing your bridal preparation from you? Are they the ones enticing you to walk different? Where, where do we understand and go to learn discernment of our faith? Who here went to the United Nations to learn your faith? <laughs> Who are you listening to? What's going on here? What if this is actually in the house? And what if the Proverbs are going to tell us it is? Hold on to that as we go through this. Look at this in the Psalms, one to three. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, those who are missing the mark, nor sits in the seat of scuffers. But his delight is in the way of the Torah of Yah. And in, and in his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, living waters that yields its fruit in season. And its leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers, directly linked again to the blessings that we read in the Torah. The psalmist here knew. Look at this. Wicked. Do not walk with the wicked. This is now referring to those in the house. Do not walk with the wicked. Do not walk with those who are missing the mark. Do not sit with the scoffers. Let me get this straight. Don't 
walk. Doesn't mean it doesn't say don't know. It doesn't say don't teach. It doesn't say don't love, don't pray for. It's saying don't walk with them. Have discipleship, fellowship with them. They are missing the mark, and you are now sitting with scoffers. Is it important who we fellowship with? Is anybody starting to learn that over your spiritual journey to date? <laughs> that it actually matters who we're actually in, in fellowship with? The wicked are not so. They are like chaff, and the wind drives them away. They're blown around by every wind of doctrine. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment. Whoa. Now we're back to the Proverbs. Nor the sinners, nor those missing mark in the congregation of the righteous. For Yah knows the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked will perish. Why is knowledge being on the heart seem to matter so much? Why? Why can't I just have knowledge? Why can't I just have my gadgets? Why can't I just have my internet? Why can't I just have and give my own understanding? I don't need a counsel. I don't need any of this. I don't know why Messiah came here and modeled discipleship and went out and told us is the only command he did give us, and that was to make disciples of nations. I don't know why he said that. He just, I don't know, didn't have anything better to say. That's what he said. He didn't mean it when he said go make disciples of nations, did he? The king just said it for no reason. In Isaiah 11, 12, uh, 10, 12 says this, in that day, the root of Jesse, so the Netzer, the Netzer. So the ancient people referred to themselves as the Netzerim, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a, single, as a signal for the people of him shall the nations inquire. And his resting place shall be glorious. Oh, <laughs> indeed. This is speaking of our Messiah. In that day, think the last great day, think the final age of redemption. In that day, Yah will extend his hand yet a second time. And to recover the remnant and the remains of his people from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, from the coastlands of the sea, from the four corners of the earth. He will raise a signal for the nations. Ooh, I wonder who that signal is. Could it be something that will have dominion? Will be a part of bringing forth something from Yerushalayim and will assemble the banished of Israel. He's going to assemble the banished, that which has been put to the four corners of the earth. Israel is a people. The house of Israel is a people that have been banished. He's going to assemble this and gather the dispersed from Yehuda and from the four corners of the earth. We're going to see this happen. And this right ruling that comes apparently is related to the knowledge of him, to the understanding of that knowledge that is going to translate into the application of it, the dominion of it. And apparently this plays out in parables, in questions, in repetition. It's the way he does it. Jeremiah 31, 31, 32, the covenant. It says in, in the Proverbs in chapter two, when we read that there's somehow a people that have forsaken this and they've done this because of spiritual adultery. They've gone down this path of this strange woman. Behold, the days are coming, declare Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. So he's doing a second time. And he says, in the Israel and of the house of Yehuda. So this is clearly from a position where there are two houses that are going to need to become one. And it's interesting where this goes, what I'm going to read here in Jeremiah. So he starts off with house of Israel and the house of Yehuda. Not like the covenant that I made with the fathers on the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt. Okay, so we're seeing the, the great uh, exodus. And then the giving of the Torah and Sinai, and of course, what we call the Ten Commandments, this covenant. My covenant that they broke 
Look at this, though. Look how he talks and gained bridal language, though I was their husband, declares Yah. It's all bridal language. Is there a bridal governance coming? Are we living the shadow picture of understanding the intimacy it takes to have dominion, to be included as a part of his dominion? Do we understand the intimacy that it takes? Because the closest thing we have in the shadow picture of life is marriage. No wonder it's on such a tactic these days. For this is the covenant. Okay? So don't believe me. Don't believe yourself. Don't believe anyone else. Let's just read the word here. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. Notice no longer, it's not the house of Israel and the house of Yehuda now. They're together. I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yah, I will put my Torah, my law within them, and I will write it on their heart. The lave. In Hebrew, the inner man, the mind, the soul, the nefesh, understanding, inner part, knowledge, thinking, reflection, inclination, this determination, this conscience, this actual appetite that they will have in the actual seat of emotions and passions. Look at this as a seat of courage. Do you mean that that which may have dominion is going to actually not be sitting in the seat of scoffers anymore, but in that of the courageous, that which has overcome, that which will have dominion and be trusted with it. And this is all in the first to what we call chapters of Proverbs? Is there a real reason why he established the meaning for this? Then here, look at this, with his prayer, Solomon's prayer. And do you know what he's saying to Yah? He's giving back to him. This is interesting, this wise king. He's going now, you hear, Yah. <laughs> this is my prayer. Hear this. This is a king entrusted with these words, the son of King David, we, we literally now is making a prayer. You hear, ya. If this is here and do, and it's two way, then here in heaven, your dwelling place. Here, please hear this and forgive and act and render to each whose heart you know. Only he knows our hearts according to all his ways for you. You only know the hearts of the children of mankind. The heart is desperately wicked and who can know it? However, a heart transformed by the power of the Ruach with the wisdom of Elohim going from knowledge to understanding that eventually is translating to wisdom that is written on our heart. And indeed, the very covenant itself. And he's sitting there saying, you know how to render these hearts. You hear, ya. do this. What did Solomon understand? What did King David understand? when he wrote the Psalms and his final repentance shuv of his life. When does knowledge become understanding and understanding become wisdom? I want you to hang on to this question as we look at the Proverbs. When does this happen? What is this great question? When does all this knowledge become actual understanding? And when does that understanding actually become wisdom? Because apparently, the wisdom is the bit we're going to need if we're going to be a part of discernment and dominion as a part of his plan of his final age. Okay, let's finish there. It's the opening of the Proverbs. And just think about that last and final question. When does all our so-called knowledge become actual understanding? And when will that understanding truly translate to wisdom? Because if he's actually looking for wisdom, to actually be on the heart of that which will sit with him, that will give dominion with him. I would say the Proverbs, in a time of so much knowledge available to us, is one of the most important books I know of contained in the Tanakh, outside of the Torah itself. We'll finish there and we'll come back and, uh, and have a quick Q&A.